Isaiah chapter 8. We're going to just stay there briefly. If you've got your outline, uh, we're going to jump right into it tonight. A lot of great things are happening, a lot of stirring in our heart. Man, I'm telling you, I can't be any more excited than I am right now, just looking for, anticipating that. How many of you know when God begins to speak to you, there's just a little a stirring, man. It just kind of just, you, you just get, you ever felt giddy? How many of you know what giddy is? You just feel giddy, you know, like, like when Jody answered the phone for the first time. I remember, <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. How many of y'all know, you know I mean? We live in, the, we came from a generation, most everybody here comes from the generation where you actually had to call the girl, right? And so you contemplated that, oh, no, no cell phones. You had to sit there and you stare at the phone for 30 or 40 minutes and, and then, I don't know about you, man. You call, and all of a sudden, somebody answered. You hang up. It's like, ah, oh, I'm not ready yet. I'm just got to get, you know. You start getting that little giddy feeling, and they know it. Come on. How many of you know they know that? And they just intimidate the fire out of you with that. And all of a sudden, man, and I'll never forget, man, just, just that feeling for the very first time when I, when I got the curtain, I called up, and, and I heard a voice on the other end of the phone. It wasn't her dad. It wasn't her mom. You know, I would have hung up again if it was. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, that feeling of just that, that man, it's, there's a connection being made. And I just feel that. I, I, so I want this relationship. Are you with me now? And when we approach the Lord that way, where it's just, man, just an excitement. I just, you know, he's going to, I mean, you know, what will he say to me? What, what's it going to be like? And, and man, I tell you what, it just gets that feeling when the Lord just begins to move. Amen? That's that preparation time. I just feel it. I feel it down in my spirit. So in Isaiah chapter 8, very briefly, we'll look at... Basically, point one and two on your outline is a recap, and then we're going to get into number three, which is where I want to really kind of uh, bring, it to, bring it to light. I've got a couple of things I added in point number two, but we're talking about, just so you know, we're talking about discovering or understanding the spirit of adoption. To be signs and wonders, to, to have our lives begin to represent what God is looking for, we have to grow and mature and become what he's calling here sons of God. All right? Now, that's not gender as in it excludes women. That's not what it's saying. Sonship means just unmaturing. Amen? So it's man or woman or both, hopefully, right? And so it says here in the Old Testament... About 720 to 30 years before the Lord Jesus Christ was born, God was sending a message through the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Behold, I, Isaiah speaking, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel. For the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Zion, in Mount Zion. And so from him. So you see here the Lord of hosts. We see that the first point, I just remind you, God's people who are in covenant with him they're created and called to be signs and wonders. They're not called to seek for signs and wonders. Their life is going to be a sign and wonder. We all know what a sign is. I've said that for several Wednesday nights, that a sign is something that leads you to make sure you're on the right path. Amen? When people are wanting to come to God, right now, there's, look, it'd be like, you know, when, when something isn't real clear, we talked about Sunday morning, Monet began to paint abstract because the, the, he wanted to fit in with what people wanted in that day and hour. He started out very detailed, very specific, very beautiful, and then it began to get more abstract and just blobs of pain and, and you know, oh, that's a flower or that's a, a ray of sunshine or whatever. And so and he began to get abstract. They asked him why, and they said, well, because people want now, they want to use their own imagination. They're bored with looking at detailed pictures. They've seen them so much. You understand, we've read the Bible so much and so many times, and we've gone over Scripture and after Scripture to where now it just kind of, it just kind of gets lost in our imagination. And, and so now it just becomes subject to, well, they believe it means this. And you can take any 10 or 12 different people who are Bible scholars, read the same verse, and they'll all have an, an subjection or a viewpoint of what it means. Come on now. And when we, when we got to that place, then the Bible became less and less effective in the believer's life because we lost the, the detail of what God was saying. And so we're not a sign anymore to a lost generation. Come on now. Jody found on CNN now, there was an a, a article yesterday, I believe it was, that said that in the last seven years, the, the percentage... You saw it too? The percentage of Christians, of believers, 
has dropped 7% across the, across the country. Now, that's a big number. 7% from what it was. And I mean, 56%, as it said, as the article went on to say, I mean, that, that are actually believing that Jesus Christ is Lord. It, it's an amazing thing. And so why is that? Because the Bible has become irrelevant. And the, and the teaching and the show in the pulpit and the glimmer and the glitz and the lights, that's become relevant. And so now we're in that same thing that Monet faced. Are we going to sell out or are we wanting to be what God wants to use us for as believers, as a church? Amen. Because we're not, the church right now is not sending anybody to Christ. There's a lot of people praying when they get down and out. Right. But there's no connectivity. There's nothing there because now it's just subject to what you think. Sin has become, um, what do they call it? Uh, Brother Charlie, I mean, I know it's, um, uh, I can't remember now, not compromise, but, you know, now it's just um, you know, a mistake. Instead of understanding the, the value of what that means to God, you understand, sin is still separation from God. And then we've made it where it's just sloppy agape and greasy grace, and you don't want to tell the truth anymore. Listen, we've got to overcome that to be signs and wonders. There has to be a maturing. You know, this is not romper room. It's not children's ministry. It's adults that are, that are needing to get God's dream fulfilled in their life. And so the signs and wonders, God wants to use you in amazing things, amazing acts. Just like how many of you imagine what it must have been like if you'd have been standing there when David stood his ground against Goliath? Come on now. Everybody's shaking in their boots and hiding behind trees and stones. And David walks out there and stands his ground. I told somebody today, I said, the last thought that went through Goliath's mind was, I never knew Jesus was that strong. <laughs> he got a rock of revelation right between the eyes. Come on now. Understand? The church has that power. But yet we're running from demons instead of demons running from us. We got to get back to where there's a quickening of the Spirit of God and training. And so, here it says about the Lord of hosts, and we saw that means the Lord Jehovah Shabbioth, which is the Lord of his army as a noun, and the Lord who fights the battle is the verb. Now, the big question that we hear often and all the time is this. Why do some get it and some don't? Why did this one get healed and this one did not? Why did this person... You know, well, then we automatically revert to what we call sovereignty. And so when you're believing in sovereignty and predestination, throw away your Bible. Because if it's predestined by God, you don't have a chance to change it anyway. Come on, how many of you know when God sets his will on something, it's going to come to pass? When God says it, it's not negotiable. It is going, it is his will, and it is to be fulfilled. But we have to align ourselves with that. And so God is the one that fights the battles, and what he asks us for is just to show up and say, I believe, all right? And so God doesn't share his glory with, with man or with anything, but God will use man to reflect his glory. And so that's what God, that's a sign and a wonder. It's when God is glorified, when we begin to see his mighty arm and his strength made known. And so the second thing there you see is understanding his plan and destiny. And what I'm going to say tonight is that's the maturity of faith. Everybody say maturity, maturity of faith. Come on, say it out loud. Maturity of faith. God wants us to grow up. We'll always be children of God, but we'll grow up. I, I love it because when I think about God using children, I think about how, you know, God defeats devils with, with children. Now, I'm not talking about children like you and I talk about. I'm talking about childlike faith. I just believe. God said it. I just simply believe it, you know. Now, that's easier said than done. How many of you know that? All right. And so go to Romans chapter 8, and we'll pick up right there. I see so many times when Jesus talked about, be it unto thee according to what? To your faith. That tells me that there's a, a pretty important factor of my life, of my spiritual walk, that needs to be strong. It needs to be stronger. Amen? Now, God gives us grace 
in order to get there. Grace is the maturity option. It's what God gives us to overcome our weakness and overcome things we don't understand and, and learn to trust him. And so this is what it takes. Now, so it, I tell you like this, a mature faith has learned to stop consulting the question why. Are you with me? It's someone who's trained enough, they're, they're keen enough, they've sharpened their, their sword enough that when, you know, I know what God's word says and anything that, that's going to contradict that. Now, that sounds fanatical and maybe so, but I'll tell you this, it's mature faith. Now, I don't have to go around and shout it out in Walmart and go and, you know, beating people over the head with the Bible. I just simply have to, in my heart, determine what I believe. Amen? And you have to do the same thing. And so that's what we're talking about. Now, Romans chapter 8 verse 14, I'm kind of walk, walking through it because I don't want to preach, re-preach everything that was, was done uh, last week. So we're kind of moving quickly through to get down there to point number three. But we need to keep everything in context so it flows. Verse 14 is, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? Sons of God. For you have, you have not received the spirit of bondage, so there is a spirit of bondage, un, again, unto fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Everybody say spirit of adoption. Spirit. All right, that's what our point is, what that means. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abbas means daddy. Where we understand that the relationship is not just father, but daddy. How many of you know how that just personalizes a relationship? Daddy. Understand? I, you know, there's many fathers, but I only had one daddy. Come on now. And so, so it's the personalization when they become that relationship just gets to that point of intimacy that it's daddy. And so it says as many. So we see right there when the, when the scripture reveals something like that, for as many as are led, as many would, would imply that not everybody. Are you with me? Now, our misconception in our generation is everybody. You know, that, that, that would, would prophesy or speak a word or whatever. We think all of that is of God. And we don't know how to discern whether it is or is not. Come on now. But how many of you know the Spirit of God will lead you in the right direction? And the result will be evident, right? Now, so as many would imply or give us the understanding, not everybody is going to arrive at that place. And it's just, that's just, it's not up to us to decide. It's up to me personally to decide if I want to stretch myself out there and be one of the many. Right? So as many. So that, that also implies that there's a choice. Are you with me? Let me ask you this. How many of you understand that, that God, we're not a little puppet hanging by strings and God is doing, moving us around, right? How many of you know that? How many of you understand that that's not how it works? Although you would think that's the way it is if you listen to some folks. But we're not a puppet. We're not there and God just, and just controlling everything we do. He gave us a will. That's why it says as many. <laughs> okay? It's a choice. It's a choice every day, every decision, everything that I'm doing that's important for my life, ministry, family, whatever. It's decisions, right? And so as many. Now, right on the flip side of that, this is important. How many of you understand that someone who is under the influence of demonic activity, they're not being a puppet on the string for him? You understand? You can choose to overcome him, and the Spirit of God will lead you into victory. So what am I saying? You're not a puppet for anybody, not even God. He doesn't want that. He's not trying to do that. He wants us to choose him as daddy and trust him as daddy. When you can get to that development of that relationship, you know that daddy has your best interest at heart. Are you with me now? There's fathers that walk away. But daddy's always there. Come on now. So the, the developing of this scripture right here is Paul is describing as many as are led, meaning that not everybody will. It's a choice. And it doesn't mean that God is going to control everything you do. It simply means he wants you to understand he's daddy. All right. 
He said, they are the sons. So, so the children who are not ready, you understand? They're not sons. That's, not, that's children of God. They're not mature. Uh, the word son in, in the Greek language is weos, and it means maturity. They've grown to maturity. Amen? And, you, you know, so we start out as children, spiritually speaking, and then we want to mature so that we can be led by the Spirit of God and have that maturity so that it's obvious. That's what he's saying, that it becomes obvious, all right? For you have not received the spirit of bondage again under fear, but have received the spirit of adoption. Now, the spirit of adoption describes God's work. You see that. Now, Sunday morning, we established the understanding that like we understand adoption in our on our understanding, adoption is when a parent, our parents come together and they say, we, want, we don't have children, we want to adopt, or we do have children, and we want to adopt. And they go through the process legally, and when they sign the stroke of the pen across the paper, then legally that child is theirs. But you understand, even in that sense, that child, if they're old enough, they have to develop the understanding that, that you are mom and dad. You have to convince them of that, right? You have to show them love. And sometimes they've been through abuse. They've had rejection. They've had uh, uh, exceptional things that's happened. Are you with me now? And so all of those things that they have that's been involved with that, with their life up to that point has to be overcome. Well, you understand, when we enter into this developing stage with God, we have to overcome all of those emotions and all of those things that have happened. Amen? Amen. And so religion can't do that for you. And so when Paul is describing this here, the spirit of adoption, notice it's a capital S because it's the spirit of God, where God is proving himself. Are you listening? Now, you can't wait until the doctor looks at you and says you have to die and cannot live to start understanding how to be led by the spirit of God. You can't wait until something of that magnitude happens to try to understand God's developing stage of your life. You have to be doing this all the time. That's the point. Because I see here, I have a note, led by the Spirit, the word led, and I have what it means in the Greek, the present passive adjectival means being led continually. All right? That would be the, the implication there of that verb. All right? You're doing an action because someone else is influencing you. And in this case, it's the Spirit of God. And in doing so, you're starting out learning how to follow that leading. Let me give you an example. I told you, and I'm telling you every service, use the fruit of the Spirit to guide you. How many of you studied them? I asked you Sunday morning to study them. How many of you know what they are? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, Goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith. All right? And so that's your guide. If I'm going to make a decision and I want to be led by the Spirit, let's say, for instance, someone has offended you or someone has done something evil to you, and it's within your power to restrain them. Are you with me? You know, maybe they borrowed some money from you 10 years ago. Come on now. Now, all of a sudden now, because you're mad at them, you're going to, I want that money. I want it now. Are y'all listening now? Now, then you first, you got to ask yourself, now, is that the love of God? He said, love your enemies. Do good to them that despitefully use you and speak all manner of evil. So what would the reaction of the spirit be? You know what I would do? When that thought enters my mind, As a believer being led by God, I'm just going to instantly say, no, I'm going to give them something. Oh, now you got to crucify the flesh to do that. Oh, come on, somebody. Y'all ain't listening to me tonight. Listen, this is how you develop being led by the Spirit. You have a guideline. Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Am I doing this with joy or begrudgingly? Am I doing this with peace or am I just doing it because I have to? See, that's bondage. I'm doing it because I'm afraid if I don't, God's going to punish me. That's the bondage of fear he's talking about. Come on now. We're trying to put this in real time. And so, you know, it's always, if, if, if something, if you want to get vengeance, then the first thing you should do is compare it to the fruit and say, no, no, you know, 
God said, vengeance is mine. I'm going to let God handle that. So what am I going to do? Because I want to be led by the Spirit. I'm going to respond with love. I'm going to be long-suffering. Come on now. You know, so many times it's like, well, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I did this and I did that. And you're going, you know, so we get impatient when they're not getting quick as we are, we think. Come on now, y'all not listening to me. You understand? Long-suffering. So when you start getting impatient, whether it be with your children or, your, or whoever, you understand, the people that are working with you or beside you, you understand, and, and they just don't quite know how to get the job done, and, but you picked it up like that and you just get frustrated. You know, think about, now wait a minute. Before I go getting angry, come on now, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, well, you know what, I'm just going to be long-suffering. I'm just going to show them again. And if they don't get it the second time, I'm going to show them again. If they don't get it the third time, I'm going to show it again. If they don't get it, then I'm going to fire them. No. <laughs> we don't put a time limit on long suffering. Are you listening to me? It doesn't run out. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And when my flesh starts getting aggravated, I've got a guideline. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. If I want to be led by the Spirit of God, I've got to understand the Spirit of God. If I want to arrive at adoption where I am now being trusted. See, it's one thing for you to learn to trust God, but what you have to understand is God wants to trust you. That's what adoption does. When God can trust you with his anointing, when he can trust you with his word, when he can trust you with his power, come on, where you're not going to use it for yourself and God can trust you. It's, it's, an, it's an easy thing for me to trust God because he's God. I mean, come on, who's going to debate that? But when I've got to understand, why God, why didn't you do something? God may not trust me yet. I may not be mature enough for that yet. You know, we get in a bind. Man, if I just had a million dollars, man, it'd just solve all my problems. No, it wouldn't. You'd have more problems than you knew what to do with. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> we just, we think that way, but we have to understand, if you want God to be able to trust you with anything that he is going to bring to you, you've got to give it to him. You understand? I love it when people say, my gift, my calling. Listen. Until you can understand it don't belong to you. Come on now. You're not mature yet. When it's mine, it ain't his. Well, God gave me a gift. He gave you a gift so he could use it. But see, we think about gifting. When I get a Christmas gift, it's mine. God gives me a gift. We think the same thing. It's mine. No, it's not yours. It's still his. He's given you an opportunity to be used by him. That's why... It was so amazing when John the Baptist said, I must, oh, you want to be adopted by God and be trusted by God. You have to start doing some decreasing and not depending on yourself. See, adoption, I explained to you last week, is a process. And when it, just like in, they still do it today, whenever that son has learned the family business and the dad comes out and announces to all publicly, the elders of the church and all, he says, this is my son. Well, I've seen you with him since he was a little bitty tot. That doesn't make sense, but that's what's called the spirit of adoption. Now, we're going to look at it some more. And so it's a maturing. They are the sons of God. Sons means a mature like the son. All right. And so we see that Jesus, let's read a few more verses. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs. That word joint heirs means equal. Now, see, my my religious mind cannot conceive that. I I just and, and you just can't imagine equal. With Christ. Well, when I understand that Christ is in me bringing that to pass, he says, if so be, all right? So, so there's a condition with this happening here to be joint heirs, to be, to, be, to become sons. If so be that you suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Now, 
That verse right there, religion takes that and says, well, that explains why some good people suffer disease and sickness and, 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 and lack and all that sovereignty thinking stuff. But that word suffer in the Greek means to allow. So then I have to think, what did Jesus allow? Well, there's 22 miracles recorded in the Bible. Now, he may have done those repeatedly several times. Because John noted that and there's so many miracles that he did, you couldn't record them all. So they just recorded the ones that were subjective or to a category. However, not everybody got healed. Not everybody got raised from the dead. Not everybody got their, got fish. And bread that was multi. I mean, how many of you would have liked to have a piece of that fish? I, 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 you know, I don't want the original. I want one of them ones that God made. No, y'all not with me now. You understand? I mean, I, I want one. You know, man, look, anybody can have fish that they call out the pond. But when God starts making fish with batter on it, deep fried, come on now. Cajun style with that good old garlic bread. <laughs> Geez, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. I mean, just to labor a point. You understand, these people were, were, were the 5,000. Come on now. It wasn't everybody. I mean, if I'd have been in Jerusalem and found out that, that Jesus multiplied a few little bags of fish and a few loaves of bread, a few pieces of fish and a few loaves of bread, I'd be like, when's he going to do it again? I want to be there. Wouldn't you? What I'm saying is, he, the, he had to allow people to stay the way they were. Because he was on a mission to go to the cross. We don't think that we're on an assignment here. We waste time. Come on now. We waste energy. We waste effort. We don't realize. I mean, listen, you can get hung up in somebody else's problem and emotions. You understand? And that's when you got to be listening for God. Oh, come on now. We had to learn that in pastoring. You understand? In other words, you just got to keep it rolling. Why? You have to allow certain things, even though you know it doesn't line up with the word. Are you listening now? And so he goes, <clears throat> this is what brings maturity. How many of you know that Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 says that, even though he was a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. We think that, that just means on the cross. No. That means all of his life. That means that Jesus, for the 12, from the time he was 12, doing his bar mitzvah till he was 30, whenever he was baptized and God said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased, which was a statement of adoption being completed. You understand? In that time frame, there were things he had to allow. How many of you understand he was always the Christ? How many of you understand he could have healed the sick when he was 14 years old? <laughs> you understand? But he was an obedient. He was restrained. He was following the leading of the Father. He never did anything that he took credit or blame for. He always said, this is the work of the Father. This is the work of Daddy. This is him. Come on now. And so we have to understand if we want to mature in our faith, that's required to learn to hear and obey. Obedience is better than, why do you think he said that? Because we'll sacrifice our time, we'll sacrifice our time, we'll sacrifice just in the, and listen, there was one guy in the Bible in Philippians that Paul dealt with, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was dead, almost dead because he had a work of the ministry. He just sacrificed himself. How many of you know that was not required by God? But in his immaturity and wanting to serve and wanting to do, you know, you understand, God would have, if he were led by the Spirit, he'd have never gotten that condition. And Paul said, look, I've got to leave him there. Y'all looking at me really funny. I told you, we're not in children's church here. You may not have ever heard this before. You need to hear this. Why? Because, listen, to, uh, to accomplish the great things God has coming down the road, we've got to understand this. Now, as many 
Come on now. You get to be a part of all the blessings. But there should be something in us that says, I want to grow. I want to mature. All right, now, <clears throat> the spirit of adoption, Romans 8, 15 right there said, adoption means sonship, that they're, they've arrived at the place where they can be trusted by the Father. And I show, I show, there, that I show there emphasis, it emphasizes, emphasis, <laughs> It emphasizes the full enjoyment of the privileges of legal airship. Now turn to Galatians chapter 3. I want to show you something. We're going to get there. We're fixing to kick it in overdrive. <clears throat> you have to understand something. When I get hung up in something, it's because I'm not sure we're getting the point across. When you're looking at me like a cow looking at a new gate, or hog looking at a wristwatch. Understand? I'm, I'll just stay there for a minute. So you need to let me know. Okay, I got it, preacher. Move on, man. I want more. I'm hungry. I'm, but if you're just sitting there like, I wonder what we got for dinner. Wonder what, I wonder what they're doing over at the other place. You know, come on now. I need to know that you're getting it. I, and we'll move. Okay? So I need to hear that. I need to, and that. That's being led by the Spirit and also being quickened by understanding, okay, we're, we're putting it out there. I want to I run down this road. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, we'll move through them. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father. Verse 29, and if you be, all of you, Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All right? Now, chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> now I say that the heir, as long as he is immature, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Do you understand that there is not one blessing God hasn't put in your account? There is not one need that you could ever encounter that God hasn't already Everybody say already. Now that's the key to faith. It's already there. But I've got to be led by the Spirit to get there. The beautiful part about God the Father is if I'm immature, there are mature people who can give you word of knowledge, word of wisdom, who can prophesy, who can give you a, a word of God. And then, then it's up to you. Do I believe that? Can I receive that? Come on now. And whenever we understand that God is not limited to any one way to get us moving, and the important part is moving, growing, he said, even though he's an heir and it all belongs to him, as long as he's immature, you understand what he's saying is God cannot trust you with his anointing. God cannot just trust anybody, even though you're a child of God, born in Christ Jesus, you understand? And, and have all things, but you've got to grow. And so he said, you differ nothing from a servant, a slave, though you are Lord of all, though it's all yours. I've never seen my children go to the refrigerator and ask for something that's in there. I've never even heard them say thank you after they ate it. You got the point, right? Verse 2. But you see, someone who is mature begins to appreciate. Begins to appreciate watching the anointing of God change lives. It is amazing. I'm going to tell you, I learned a long time ago, I can't preach good enough. I can't run. I can't jump high enough. I can't twirly bird. I can't do anything to, to cause that to happen. But what I can do is learn the word of God. But that person who is growing is under tutors and governors. Everybody say submission. I'm saying that, that don't happen anymore. I mean, that's, uh, that's unheard of in our generation to understand the, the strength of authority that God delegated. 
Well, because we've never been under delegated authority and true authority, we got people that call themselves authority and we trust in them, but they're under some other influence anyway. And so this is why the body of Christ is so discombobulated. We don't even know what it means. We don't even know who the, who the tutors and governors are. We'll listen to any old person because we think they're under the spotlight. They must know something. But there is divine authority. I can tell you right now. I've been under one since 1991, and it's been amazing. Until the time, now notice this, until the time appointed of the Father. How many of you think that's pretty amazing? What is the time appointed? That's when he says, I can trust you with it. You're ready. I'm ready to use you. Oh. Verse 3. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. We were exposed to all of the curse and all the elements that go along with it. Are you with me now? All right, so you see what that means. Verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive, here we go, now it's not the spirit of adoption. He took us through the process of becoming adopted. Going from immaturity to being trusted by the Father with his anointing. You understand? We got more show in the pulpits nowadays than we've got anointing. And so it's no wonder we don't recognize one from the other because anybody can put on a show. But not anybody can lift a burden. To redeem them that were under the law. This is what Jesus did that we might receive the adoption of sons. He is for you. Look at your neighbor and tell him God is for you. He is not holding back from you. He is for you and intends for you to get to that place. But until you do, you're no different than a slave. And he says, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, now, where have we seen that before? Do you understand the impact of maturing? You understand, he's not talking to the preachers. He's not talking to the, what we think is elite and who's got the most degrees. He's talking about those who have spent the time with daddy. Learning to be led by the Spirit of God, not by the Spirit of man, not by... How many of you understand, you will choose your own will over God every time? All you've got to do is convince yourself that it's God's will for you, and you will put God's name on it every time. And we've seen it happen hundreds, if not thousands of times. And all you've got to do is just sit back and watch, because it'll show. Watch. I have here... <clears throat> That there are, the adoption of sons, there are no premature sons in the kingdom of God. There is no such thing. It does not exist. It will never exist. It is not, a, it is not, it is, it is not ever going to be. You understand? When we don't get ourselves in line with God's plan and destiny, you understand, we're never going to be to that place where we can be trusted with God's anointing. Jody and I made one decision 20 years ago, before we were senior pastors, that we were going to do what God wants to do. I can't tell you how many times, by my own experience, that I have convinced myself that it was the will of God when it was not. Come on now. I could write a book. All right. So let's finish up. All right. Turn with me to... The kingdom principle. This is the principle that always works by. It always is. The process I have there cannot be avoided. If you want to move in his anointing in your life and have a greater manifestation of his anointing, you cannot shortcut the process. It's not up to you. It's the time appointed of the Father. It, you can't convince him. You can't negotiate with him. You can't do anything to change. When he says it's time, it's time. God called me. December of 1981 to preach, to pastor a church. And I can promise you, not only did I think that person was a nut, because I got saved in October of 1981, October 14th. But, 
You understand? There had to come that process. Now, things happened that, that I drew closer to God. There were times when I blamed God. There were times when I, I wondered why God was doing this, when it wasn't God doing it at all. Come on now. It was, it's a process. You can look back and learn how things work, you know, and then you can help others. You can teach. Now, <clears throat> here we're going to look at the principle of the kingdom. You know it well. Mark chapter 4 is the parable of the sower. Bring up verse 1. We ain't got time to go through all of it. We'll go through some of it. Jesus began to teach them by the seaside. There was gathered to him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was, was by the sea on the land. <clears throat> we stood right there on that seashore. It's a beautiful place. Verse 2. And he taught them many things by parables and began and said unto them his doctrine. In his doctrine. Verse 3. Hearken, behold, there went a sower to sow. Verse 4. And it came to pass that as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Verse 5. Some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. Verse 6. And when the sun was up, it scorched. It was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Verse 7. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Verse 8. And others fell on good ground, mature ground. And you understand what I'm saying right now? I'm keeping it right in line. And it yielded fruit and sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Now, the, the, the principle here is not that some only get 30, some only get 60, and some only get 100. This is what's called an accusative affinitive in the Greek context of how grammar works. And what it simply means is that every word of God can grow to the full potential. But Jesus also said that according to the measure you measure it by as to what amount you're going to get out of it. You understand? Every religion, there's, it, I don't care what, what shingle they hang on the post of the door in front of their building, if it's denomination or whatever, if they're a believer in the blood of Jesus Christ and bless God, they are saved. You understand? But now, you know, some people choose to stay right there and not go any further. You understand? They're saved, their spirit is saved, and their body is subjected to the elements of the world, and they'll never get healed. I don't care what you think. God doesn't work through unbelief. You're either going to believe or you ain't, and if you don't, then that's it. It never changes. The principle of the kingdom of God is it works by seed. Seed, Jesus defined this whole parable. I'll stop right there. He described the wayside with those that hear the word and immediately the enemy comes in and starts bombarding their mind before it has time to go into their heart where they truly believe it and he plucks it out. He'll use people to do that. He'll use others. And if you're not mature enough to understand, you will be subjected to a lie. He said the stony ground of those that he said, man, he said in their heart, there's things that are there. You understand that they're hardened, they're thoroughly mixed and well set and they're never going to receive the word of God. They get the word going, but all of a sudden persecution arises or something happens. And he says, and they just wither. And then the third one, thorns. He said, the cares of this world, the lust of other things, and the deceitfulness of riches will choke the word. Now, you understand we have to grow through all of those phases. I don't know if you realize that or not. If you don't realize you've ever been one or the other of those at some time or another when you're believing God for something. But the principle of the kingdom of God works with seed in the heart that will bring forth his fulfillment of that word. Now I have on your list there, Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. As long as the earth remains, there remains seed time and harvest. Cold and heat, summer, winter, day and night, and it shall not cease. So the principle of the kingdom is seed sown, time, and harvest. Now to close tonight, come on back up, Brother Jamie. It takes time. Between the seed and the harvest, there's time. How many of you understand that? Time is where faith comes in. Between the time that I believe the word of God, receive the word of God, and want the fulfillment of that word of God, there is a maturing process. I can use the parables Jesus taught and find out where I am at any one time. Are you with me? The devil has basically no other tools. None. 
All he has to do is what it says in that last verse in Matthew chapter 13. And Jesus talked about there, verse 24. <clears throat> Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a man which sowed good seed in his field, verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit and appeared, then appeared the tares also. Verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? But where did these tares come from? What I want you to see, in conclusion, Jesus said in Matthew, I have listed there, you can look it up. He said that there's going to be false prophets, and he said they're going to sow the false word. Amen? How many of you understand that the devil's best tool is to disguise the bad seed? What does he disguise it in? It sounds good. You understand? And if you're not mature, guess what you'll take? Now, the problem is, you don't know whether you got the good seed or the bad seed until you get a harvest. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. Are you with me now? I don't ever argue doctrine with anybody because you know what? I'll wait to see what fruit comes of it. I'm not going to debate. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to get into Bible battle and, you know, and all that stuff and Bible trivia. I'm just going to wait and see what fruit is. And if they're wise, they'll do the same. Are you with me now? They may have something. They may have a revelation. So I'm going to wait and see. <laughs> you bet it is, brother. The devil disguises his bad seed and hides it in, mixes it in with the good. So what I need to do is learn to wait for the results. Don't pluck it up. Come on now. I find that when people are going through a hard time in life, they want good stuff. They don't want the generic. They don't want the look-alike. They want the power. Come on now. Jesus sowed the good seed, and it's still good. Now, there's one other thing that I wanted to bring out. I want you to go ahead and stand up on your feet. I appreciate y'all coming out tonight. There was nothing wrong with the good seed. How many of you understand? The devil cannot stop the good seed from growing. All he can do is try to sow the bad. How does he do that? Thoughts? Suggestions? You understand? And, and when we're not mature enough to understand the dynamic of the word, then we'll receive that bad stuff. And all of a sudden, when it comes time to need a harvest, you know what I found? That's when you'll really see when the fruit comes out, you'll really find out what's really there because whenever the bad fruit comes up, they start blaming everybody else. What is that? I'm trying to show you sonship and adoption is when you get where you understand what's going on in the process. Amen? Just wait for the seed. It's not a, it's not a, a pride thing, let's see who's got what, and I know more than you. No, it's not that. It's the Word of God. It's simple, and it's accurate, and it will, it will perform according. Amen? There wasn't anything wrong with the good seed. The devil couldn't pluck it up. He could only pluck it, he could only take it when it was on the wayside, when you contemplate trying to decide if you believe it and didn't go in the heart. That's when he can come and counteract it. But once it's in there, he cannot. Do you understand that parable? All he can do is try to sow some bad stuff in there with it and mix it up. But whenever we have that maturity and we'll reject that bad seed, say, no, no. And I'm going to tell you next week, we're going to start right there, and I'm going to tell you how you can overcome that. Amen? I wanted to get there tonight. I know we kind of zoomed through some of it, but I'm appreciating you coming out. I know some of you get up really early, man, and it's a long service, but 
in the urgency that I sense in my spirit, man, I'm telling you, as many, come on now, God wants us to get ready. He wants us to get ready. Bow your heads.